this is the first in a new television series starring Mary Margaret McBride. It was filmed at her home at West Shokan, New York. I'm Mary Margaret McBride, hello. And this is Eddie Dowling, and he's our wonderful guest today. We're welcoming you to uh, my Catskill home made out of a barn. And we're sitting right now, as you probably can tell, in my living room with uh, its uh, paneling, redwood paneling, and the big uh, blue stone and, and uh, brick chimney that goes way up to the ceiling where are the beams that are 200 years old beams and timbers of oak and chestnut. And uh, sometime, I hope very much that we're going to uh, show you other parts of this place, like Lover's Lane with birches and laurel, or we might be set up beside the little pond where every morning and every evening deer come to drink. Or we might go way up in the mountains where waterfalls cascade all around. Oh, let's see, the little pixie glade. Eddie would love that because I'm sure the wee people come there. Uh, the little fir trees grow up just two feet. They never get taller than two feet. And there's some mystery oh, in that. The little people must be in them, sure. The little people are in them, Eddie. <laughs> that lepra, what is it you call Han. it? Lepra -han. But most of all, I want to show our kitchen. Pine paneling, pink fixtures. And I want you to see me bake all the cakes from patty cake mixes from scratch. Because only when you do that, only when you do that, will you believe that from the time I open this box until I put the cake into the oven is only one minute. One little minute. And the price is no more than for ordinary cake mixes and the cakes themselves Oh, I forgot to tell you, I use only one bowl and one spoon, so I have almost nothing to wash up. And then the cakes that come out. The, the chocolate pecan, the almond caramel, the hello, angel food, the white cake, the yellow cake, all of them are just perfection. You wouldn't believe that a cake mix could make such cakes. I'd say it has a homemade flavor, but sometimes homemade cakes fail. Pat a cake mixes never fail. The cakes are perfection every single solitary time. Now I hope, I hope that you won't even wait to see me make the whole cake in my kitchen. I hope that you'll go right out and get pat a cake mixes. Are you looking a little hungry, Eddie? I'm gonna get some on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know about me that I tell the truth, don't you? Always. Is it, is it just the one flavor, Mary Margaret? No, or? I just told you. Didn't you hear me saying? No, I was eating the cake. I used hit one, uh, hit one. Uh, Chocolate. Pie, yeah, so I had it. And I was eating it, and then caramel I... almond. Mm -hmm. And then there, well, you may have seen devil's food, yellow, white, and angel food. Mm -hmm. Those first two are my real favorites. Well, that's the trouble with my chins, Mary Margaret. It's cake, homemade cake, so I must try that. Yes. Eddie, mm -hmm. you know why I chose you for a guest today? On this series, I'm having very special people. You know why? Because I feel that this world is in rather a mess. I believe it'll pull out of the mess. And I believe it'll pull out by the help of such dreamers as you. Eddie Dowling is a poet. He's a playwright, he's an actor, he's a, well, you're a producer, you're a director, you're so many things. You've been called almost the most versatile man on Broadway. But that isn't why I value you. I value you because you're a dreamer and because you dream true. Well, bless your heart, Mary Margaret. Some That's of your dreams don't come out, honey. Oh, well. But a lot of them do, and when they do, they're so wonderful for humanity. Why, I'm almost making you cry. You really are, because uh, you've hit me right on the head. Uh, I, have been, I have been a dreamer. And I've uh, thought many times that uh, it's been a wonderful satisfaction to be a dreamer personally, but I've wondered sometimes just how much my little family have suffered by it, although they don't complain. I remember one time you gave up, what was it, 5,000 a week to produce a dream. That's right. And did that one fail, or did it no, succeed? Oh, that, 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 that succeeded, and it... Uh, it established uh, the top first-ranking playwright of the world. Now, that was Tennessee Williams. 
Was that the, the mm -hmm. glass menagerie? Mm hmm glass menagerie. Well, of course, that's a story that's gone down in theatrical annals, hasn't oh, it? Oh, it really has, yes. And I tell you, uh, when, I, when I had the dream to do it, I, I was in such bad shape financially that I didn't feel that, you know, I could just go off. So I went to Ray, and I asked Ray, who, by the way, is in... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ray is here visiting with us today. She's over in Mary Margaret's, in the corner of the room here. I wish the camera could take in all the nice people that are here today. But anyway, I went to her and I said, Ray, I can get $5,000 a week on this other job that looks pretty sure, but I'd like to do this, I love it, and we don't, uh, I, I, I really shouldn't. She said, you do what you love. So we did it, and as a result of it, now, of course, we have Mr. Tennessee Williams. That is one dream that did pay off. Yes. Yeah. Was that his very first play, Tennessee that Williams? That was his first in New York. Mm -hmm. He'd had several chances out of New York. And uh, Tennessee is a, a strange mixture, like all poets, you know, and I don't think that Tennessee could have, have taken another failure. I doubt very much whether he could have taken another failure. And so in this case, the Lord, of course, like he always worked properly and right, he brought this one through for him. And uh, there were some moments there, though. Oh, indeed. I remember, you, uh, you see, I kept up with the glass menagerie from the beginning. You told you did, about right. it when it was just a dream in your eye. That's right. And then you told, you came back from places to tell about rehearsals and so on. And finally it was in Chicago. And people were staying away in droves. Oh. <laughs> weren't they? I don't think anybody in Chicago came. A few people en route to California came to see us personally. Taylor and I, you know. Laura Taylor. Yes, but uh, then they finally the last couple of weeks it, it caught on. But one of the cute things about the thing, Mary Margaret, is that, uh, well, now, you know, we were talking about what cameras do to personalities and what all these strange things that intrude on people of the theater like we are. This, Like you I know, am? Yes, you too, dear. There are, there are super sensitive or hypersensitive people. And just this, just that, now, in the many plays that I've directed and the greatest actors and actresses that have walked the stage, certainly during our lifetime, I've directed. And uh, as well as they know their stage, and as well as they know their art, if you dare do that at certain moments in their performance, you destroy it. You destroy your mood. So you and I were talking before we went on today, and I think it's well for this audience that will be seeing you now on, t on this television series for the first time to know uh, this that when you see a person a tiny bit nervous, uh, that aren't as completely relaxed as uh, these great television personalities that are coming into your home all the time, uh, please believe me, a director who's directed the greats of the world, that you are looking at a very, very great person. Eddie, darling, you make me feel better about being nervous. <laughs> I'll probably go on being nervous till the end of time. I have something here I want to show you. That's a record. And you could never guess what it's a record of. What is it a record of? Mary? Well, it's a, it's a very old record. A friend of mine who collects them uh, gave it to me. And it's of somebody singing Arowana. Does that mean anything <laughs> to you? <laughs> Arowana on my honor, I'll take care of you. <laughs> oh, gosh, Mary Margaret, that's the day I ran away from home. I got on a freight train in Providence, and I didn't know where it was going, and I, I didn't really run, mean to run away, you know, kid-like, and I wound up in Boston. And I got a job in a store called Praise Music Store, demonstrating music. You know, I'd sing a chorus, and then you or some of the customers would buy it, and this is it. <laughs> That's it. And, and uh, how were you? Oh, I, I don't think I was nine. Not uh, ten years old, no, even. I, I always thought you were about ten, which no, was young enough. No, I wasn't. I'm sure I wasn't. And uh, that night I slept in the theater. I slept. I got a job later in the day at a place singing illustrated songs. The Premier Theater at the corner of Beach and Washington Street. I had no money or anything, and I'd starved all day long. And uh, I went to sleep down in the basement, uh, you know, near the furnace to keep warm. And... Uh, uh, I don't know, sometime later I was awakened by the porter and the policeman. And I was taken to the Grand Street Station where they accused me of stealing the night watchman, the porter's overcoat. Mm. And uh, so the sergeant who afterwards became the great commissioner of police under Coolidge during the, you know, the, the police strike, he said, why would the little boy steal your coat? He said, because he had asked me for some money to eat and I didn't have any. So I thought naturally he'd steal the coat. 
But I was, uh, this fellow, Crowley, this great commissioner, took me home to his lovely Irish wife who had five or six kids of her own, and they fed me nicely, and uh, I got a week's pay, and I was sent home in great style. That was really the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that was the first song I really ever sang professionally. What Where did you get that? Oh, I told you, this man collects, uh, Clarence oh, Brown, I think his name is, he collects uh, old records. Mm, well, Eddie, well, wasn't your mother awfully upset at you leaving home so young? Yes, but of course it took my mother about a day to find it out, because remember, there were 17 of us. And uh, when one kid strays off the reservation, when there's 16 others, you know, it takes a little while to find out. But she was, bless her heart, she was concerned, she was a great mother. Only great women can have 17, Mary Margaret. Mm -hmm. And I think with the coming of each new one, the responsibility comes more keen, more, more acute with them. But she was really a truly a great soul. Uh, you couldn't have got your dreaming from her, though, Eddie, could you? No, my father was the dreamer. My mother was the worker. She tilled the soil with her hands, and when she died, her little fingers were all bent. We had this few rocky old acres there in Rhode Island, you know. But my father was a great dreamer. If he'd had an opportunity, well, he, he possibly would have been perhaps one of the greatest Shakespearean actors that ever lived. You know, you just had to die up in my community when I was a little boy. Somebody get married or die or a fireman's muster, and my father had something out of Shakespeare that applied, you know, that was good for any occasion. That's why you can always quote everything, can't you? <laughs> Pretty near. <laughs> I read the other day something about you and George Bernard Shaw. I never knew you knew him. All this time I've known you, and he, I think, is probably one of the most interesting men who ever lived. Do you oh, agree? Oh, yes, indeed. Indeed, I do. I think that... Uh, Shaw, sure, perhaps of all of the playwrights of our lifetime, will be the one that will take his place in the archives with Shakespeare and the rest of the great ones. There will be others, of course, but I wouldn't be too sure about any of them, but sure, I'm certainly sure about Mary Martin. I'm always wondering, was, was he faking when he made such a fuss about himself? Was that just his way of getting publicity? Well, no, he was a cantankerous old fellow. He, uh, just, just on this last trip that I made around the world just about a year and a half ago, I went up to... Uh, I went up to the estate because it was for rent, you know. The National Society of London, he willed it to them, you know. And uh, you could have, I could have rented it for a few hundred pounds, which would be, oh, I don't know, the yearly rental of the thing would amount to about $50 a month. Think of this, for Shaw's estate. So I know the housekeeper and the gardener very well. They were with him a long time, a Mr. and Mrs. Boucher. And uh, adjoining the Shaw estate uh, is an old English colonel back from the Boer War, you know, the fellow with the jowls and the big mustache, the complete beef eater. And he hated Shaw, and Shaw in turn hated him. And the old major walked with a great big thick cane and a sword cane, you know, they take the handle off and it was a sword. And I suppose he'd taken it through several campaigns, wars. And this particular day that I got there, uh, Mr. Boucher was burning some uh, refuse or something like that. And he said, uh, Mr. Darling, he said, you'll be interested in knowing that the, one of the last things the old gentleman did with his enemy across the hedge there, there was a high hedge between the two places. He said, I was burning a lot of stuff, he said, and I didn't use good judgment because there was a high wind that day, and the old colonel was entertaining some of the gentry of the countryside, and they were having their, uh, their scotch and sodas out on the porch, an open porch, and all of, the, all of the ashes and the soot and everything was blowing in on them. So he, the old major got up and he stomped, and uh, he was as old as Shaw, by the way, and he came to the edge of the hedge, and with a, with a sword, he chopped out this piece of this hedge so he could look through at Shaw. So Shaw glared at him, and he glared at Shaw, and he said, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that I would, I don't know whether I'd be bettering the world or not, I, I'd run this through you. I've run it through far better men. And Shaw says, it break off in me. I'm, I'm so mean, and my bones are so hard, it, it'll break off. And so he shook his cane back. So the... All English major, of course, he was getting livid, you know, his blood pressure was rising. So Shaw got a little worried. He said, now, here, you take it easy. You're too old. You're too old. You don't have that kind of vitality. Now, stop it. Stop it and sit down. And I'll quench this fire immediately. Boucher, go get water. Put this out. We've made a mistake. And if you just contain yourself and not kill yourself at my expense, I don't want to be blamed for killing you. I'm blamed for enough as it is. Just behave. Relax. I promise you. My last physical, they said that I wouldn't be here three months from now, and I'll put this in my will, that any future burnings of the refuse or garbage around here, they can only burn it when the wind is blowing the other way. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, so, uh, he really, he was really quite a fellow, Mary Margaret. Mm. But I think a great old man, a great, great old man. Imagine this, this boy, one of 17 children, poor and unknown, who becomes the intimate of a person like George Bernard Shaw. You know everybody, Eddie. I've known a lot, Mary Margaret, and I don't think that, uh, when you scratch their back, you know, if you scratch it hard enough, you find out that they didn't have much more themselves when they started, many of them. Really, it's a fact. You're the uh, great American success story, only not with concentration on money. It's the other way. You've concentrated <laughs> on something better and bigger God than help, money. God help us, if it was money, I'd be no part of the story. Well, you've made millions. Now, don't tell me you haven't. Oh, I have, Mary Margaret, but I've, all, I've sent it all back in there. I know. And, of course, there is quite a, you know, there's quite a cult around this great big country of ours that don't believe that I'm fully all there, you know. <laughs> and, and, and oh, the really? Time, I said, no, really. And at times, I think my family agree with them, really, because you... Uh, you know, you have O'Neill, you have uh, Saroyan, and you have Morris Evans, and you have Kate Smith, and you have Gene Kelly, and you have Celeste Holmes, and you have a half a dozen of the ranking playwrights of the world, and then you have 20 or 30 of the ranking personalities of the world. And you find it difficult sometimes to pay your telephone bill. Now, you can't tell me, Mary Margaret, that that man is completely all there. What do you mean? <laughs> I don't understand. You say you have these. You mean I you've had, had them? Sure, yeah. surely. You managed or had something to do with their I careers. I brought in Saroyan, I brought in Tennessee Williams, I brought in Paul Vincent Carroll, I did the last uh, Eugene O'Neill play before he died, The Iceman Cometh. I introduced Morris Evans in Richard II, and Gene Kelly and Celeste Holmes, and Bill Bendix and Dorothy McGuire, and Kate Smith, and the personalities are endless. But I never was interested, Mary Margaret, in what I could make from those personalities. I was only interested in them because I knew they had a great talent and it's been rewarding enough just to share, to bask. And I'll bet anything that what you regret is not uh, any chance you passed up to make money, but some dream that you decided <laughs> or somebody persuaded you you better not do, oh, right? Oh, really, very right, very true. Mm. Eddie, tell now about the dream that's just a morning, will well, you? My, my kid, uh, land, my land of tomorrow, you mean? Yeah. Well, I hope that's going to come true, and I want it right very close to New York, you know, where all the poor little kids can see it. And I want it to have on it everything that has ever gladdened the heart of a child, like Peter Pan and the Big Bad Wolf and Little Red Riding, Riding Hood and Jack the Giant Killer and the Old Lady in the Shoe and all of those wonderful, wonderful things, you know. The leprechauns? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll be the leprechaun. <laughs> oh, no, lots of wee people. We love a lot of little wee people. We Irish always like them. Oh, indeed, and I think the world is getting to like them, too. Yeah. But I hope to bring that one off, so really. That's my newest dream, and I've had an artist, I think one of the greatest, Russell Patterson. He has really outdone himself in this, and... Uh, is there any way we can show your audience the oh, picture yes, of it? Oh, yes, why don't you show this little... Uh, um, how do I do this? Do I hold it in front of the camera, or well, how do I do it? just show it to me first. All right, now there. They can look there, at this, is the, this is the right way. Now, you mm -hmm. get that down there. Oh, now, you'll see all of them. older children come? Yes, see, now there. See, this is the railroad. Outside here, there's a road that goes all the way around this little tiny train, you know, little toy trains. And the conductor will be a little midget, and the engineer will be a midget. And nobody can ride on these trains, of course, only little tiny people, little weep folks, you know. And they'll make all these magnificent visits, and as they make them, they'll see Peter Pan flying through the air, and they'll, oh, oh a Hamlet will open the gate for them, and all of the great things. And, and Hamlet? Yeah, oh, sure. You, you know, I can feel that Hamlet is still alive, and all the great characters we've ever read in fiction, you know, especially. Oh, uh, yeah, it's all going to be, it's all going to be there. That'll be wonderful. Isn't that something? Hmm? You know what I think? What? We should dedicate that either to your grandson or to Jack. To my boy. To your boy. Well, I'd like that, Mary Margaret. Uh, and so would he like it, too, because he was a fellow of dreams. You know, he never... Uh, Jack, uh, oh, I don't, I'm sure your audience don't know much about him, but I know you do. I'm going to start to talk about Jack by telling you what Time magazine that he wrote for. You know, he was the South American editor of Time and Life when he died. Uh, just a year ago in June, he was killed in a, an airplane accident, and they signed the editorial off by saying that uh, all of the people who had written with him during the war in the Pacific, all the correspondents, they signed a round robin, and it said it made them braver just to know this fellow. And yet, in spite of all of that courage and all of the things that he accomplished as a great war reporter, 
he was a fellow of dreams. He was always looking for that fabulous tomorrow that we people of dreams will continue to look for, as he did, I suppose, until we go out. Uh, I would like to dedicate it to him because on this land of tomorrow, this world of make-believe, this never-never land that I hope I, we're all going to live to see come true, this dream, there won't be any unkindness, there won't be anything to disturb anybody, even the littlest heart, the tiniest child will be pleased in my land of tomorrow. And all of the peoples of the world, whether they're black or white or Jew or Gentile, whatever they are, they'll all be welcome in this particular place. And you know, Ray, little Ray Dooley, Mrs. Darling, his mother, sitting back of us over there, uh, when we were kids, we worked for Ziegfeld, and then she afterwards worked for Carol, Earl Carroll. And I don't know whether you remember the slogan over the stage door. It said, through these portals pass the most beautiful girls in the world. So over my little land of tomorrow, my never, never land, uh, I'm going to have a sign. And it's going to read, through these gates pass the nicest, the kindest, and the best people in the world because of their children. Mm. Eddie, I don't know how you and Ray can be so brave and wonderful about your only boy. Well, uh, I, I don't think I am especially brave, Mary Margaret, but she is the bravest woman I've ever known. She was in the kitchen when the news came and the phone rang and I picked it up and it was the editor of the Journal American. He said, I want to express our deepest sorrow in your tragedy. And I said, tragedy what? And then I heard a dish drop. And there was a commentator on the air bringing the news to Ray. And I ran out. She was getting it on her radio? She got it on her radio. And she was leaning against the... She was doing some dishes, and she had a dish in her hand, and she was leaning against the counter. And I looked at her. Yes. I, I had followed the life But she had been story. so... Her faith has been so wonderful. I think that's the thing that makes her so brave. I don't have that kind of faith. I wish I did, Mary Martin. But what do you mean you don't have it? Oh, I have some, but really you have to have divine faith to take it like she did. And My darling, uh, you believe, don't you? Oh, indeed. Indeed I do. You can't uh, go into your never-never land oh, of, of children course. without oh, no. I have, I have, believing. I have a lot of faith, but it's divine faith that takes you over a hump like that, you know, without, uh, well, you know, I mean, but he was a great guy, and she, she's just as great. What can I was the guy in between the two of them. I didn't have it, but uh, they've, uh, they've, they've pretty near made a man of me. <laughs> everywhere that Eddie yeah. Dowling went when he went around the world, people were talking about Jack. Yes, everywhere. And telling him how wonderful it was to oh, have known yes. such a boy. Uh, you see, that means everything. The lady that ran the hotel in Bangkok, it, there was no rooms there, of course. And when she found out who I was, she gave us her apartment. And so did the Sultan of Johor and the King of Cambodia and all of these people all over the world. They all knew Jack. Oh, yes, they were great. They were, they were great. Uh, Henry Luce told me once, about six months before Jack died, I was at a party with him, and he said, Eddie, this is one of the three greatest reporters that I think has ever lived. Hmm. And, uh, well, don't so think that he Oh, he's still he alive. Oh, he's, in vain. We, we believe that he's still alive, Ray and I. We believe that, uh, in fact, we, we don't believe too much in death, Mary Margaret. We believe that it's life is a continuation. It'll be too tragic to uh, leave this uh, present address and go off to what, whether it's a Never Never Land or whatever it is and not meet all those nice people that we've known here. It'd be just awful, wouldn't it, to think of anything like that? You know, between you and me, even some of the bad ones, I want to see oh, again. Oh, I do too, because I don't think that really is there's anybody intentionally bad. I think just like poor Judas, you know, what an awful fate that was designed for that poor man, don't you know? I think he's one of the most tragic figures that ever walked the earth, really, I do. Yeah. And I think there's plenty of good in the worst of us, and uh, there's plenty of bad, I suppose, too, in all of us. And Alas. Yes, I should have. Uh, you said a lovely thing to me just before we started this program. You said, I was talking about dishonesty, and you said in a sort of low tone to me, you know, Mary Margaret, in all my life I never planned anything bad. Oh, no, gosh. And maybe I, not many people do. Oh, no, I don't think anybody. I, I was a very, very small percentage of people who really plan to do anything wrong or bad, mean. I think that circumstances very often. I know if I had hungry kids, Mary Margaret, and I saw some bread on a guy's shelf, I'm going to reach in there and get it. 
And uh, I think that that's pretty much the... I think our prisons are filled with people who shouldn't be there at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't get started on that, Eddie. <laughs> oh, I can't tell you what a wonderful guest you've been today. Well, bless your heart, it's always a great pleasure being with you. And now, you know, I was recently in the Holy Land, Mary Margaret, and they have a wish over there that I think is kind of wonderful, and I'm going to wish it to you. There's a wish that they make in the Holy Land when a loved one is going away. They shake you warmly by the hand and they very sincerely say, May your road always rise ever under blue skies. Around every bend may you find a friend. May you lead every pack with the wind at your back. May your every tomorrow be grand. And may God keep you always in the palm of his hand. Oh, Eddie Dalvin, thank you for that. That's beautiful. See that cake there? Yes. Well, I'm supposed to get the cake, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, it's not really a, a, an adequate reward to you for being such yes. a grand guest. But it's my favorite of the cakes made from our patty, patty cake mix? mixes. Yeah. Our patty mm -hmm. cake mixes. Mm -hmm. This one is the caramel almond. The almonds are all ground up Could in I just there. sneak a little piece? Yeah, <laughs> don't, don't. Cut, cut, Go. cut. So they can see the, the velvety texture. So that they can see how light and yet rich oh, the cakes are that are made from the patty cake mixes. Oh, because there isn't anything like them. There isn't anything like the patty cake mixes. Homemade tasting, yes, but never a failure. Cost no more than ordinary mixes. Make a perfect cake every single solitary time. Now, what I'm hoping is that you'll please go to your dealer and get all the patty cake mixes. Not only this one, but that chocolate pecan one and the white and the yellow and the angel food patty cake mixes. Ask for those. Say, I want Mary Margaret's patty cake mixes because that is what you want. Oh, Eddie, you're, you're making a lot of crumbs, dear. Well, I'll take the crumbs. <laughs> well, it, it's <laughs> velvety crumb, anyhow. Eddie, you, uh, do you realize how nice it is up here in this region? Do you know that we've got all sorts of exciting things? We've even got a, a forest not very far from here at a place called Gilboa that's 300 million years old, the trees are. What do you think of that? Oh. And there are missing links among them. You've heard of missing links? Yes, time? indeed, I think, well, I think I'm one of them. No, these trees <laughs> are the missing links. They're a cross between trees that have seeds and ferns that don't have seeds. Mm -hmm. And sometime I'll take you there. Maybe we'll even be doing telecasts from oh, there. So. Well, in this manner, Miss McBride will conduct her interview series so popular for so many years. And as she mentioned at one point in today's interview, her country home will provide an excellent opportunity for visual variety. She'll be able to utilize numerous backgrounds with her succession of guests. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation, and thank you for watching. We've got to go until tomorrow. Will you tune us in tomorrow, please? And now, goodbye, you all. <laughs>